I don't actually remember the first time I cube drafted. I wish I did. I bet it would make for a heck of a story. Interestingly enough, I'm led to believe my first cube draft actually took place on Magic Online. You see, Magic Online had a feature where it would output a text document for each of your drafts, which would contain the names of all your opponents as well as your pick orders for the entire draft. The funny thing is, I have text files dating all the way back to 2009, about 14 years ago, documenting all of my drafts from Magic Online. With a little bit of sleuthing, I was able to not only determine that the Vintage Cube was first introduced to Magic Online on April 7th, 2012, but also that my first Vintage Cube draft took place that day. I guess I was an early adopter. As you can see from this document, which is basically a time capsule, my first pick was Lantex, passing a Consecrated Sphinx, which is something I would never do today. My second pick was Mother of Runes. My third pick was Vindicate. Fourth pick, Soltari Priest, and fifth pick was Wrath of God, which was a great choice to go along with my two creatures so far. My sixth pick was Ravenous Baboons, because of course it was. When I'd only picked white and black cards so far, why not add a red card to the mix? I followed that up with Firebolt, Pillage, Thunderblust, Steplinks, Tomb Stalker, and Devastating Dreams. The Mardu deck was coming together in the worst possible way. I rounded out this pack with Goblin War Driver, Forbid, and a last pick Corpse Dance. Since that day, over 11 years ago, cube drafting has become my absolute favorite way to play Magic. I don't think it has much in the way of competition either. I've been a competitive Magic player for the majority of my Magic career, but unlike many of my competitive peers, I feel like I differ from them in one big way. I really appreciate the customization and expression Magic offers, especially over the past few years. I went to a high school for the arts and my degree is in creative writing. I've always appreciated the act of expression and Magic is such a great vehicle for it. Even outside of the 540 individual card choices in your cube, from deck boxes to dice to sleeves to the card versions you choose, nearly every game component is able to match your style or preference. I don't know many other games that can be said about. Building a cube takes all of the customization Magic offers and allows you to dial it up to 9,000. So I did. The box I store my cube in is a custom large Spartan cube box by Aaron Kane. Aaron makes a ton of amazing Magic boxes and accessories, and I have several of his products. The wood I chose here is Purple Heart, and the inlay and splines are made from maple. I like the contrast of the darker Purple Heart with the lighter maple, so that's what I went with. The engraving on the top is the Magic Online cube logo along with my initials, set in Mother of Pearl. I even used the Bellerin font. I also added a dice vault from Aaron Kane in the opposite configuration, a maple body with purple heart splines. Inside, I have 48 Warpip dice from Norse Foundry in their bardic purple color, meant to mimic the color profile of the cube box itself. Each die is made from a zinc alloy and weighs about 10 grams, or the weight of four pennies, which are also made of zinc. So they're pretty hefty. For sleeves, I needed something opaque due to the proliferation of double-faced cards in Magic. Thankfully, the Dragon Shield dual matte sleeves have been a godsend in this regard. They have some amazing colors and new ones seem to be coming out regularly. These have an opaque back and a black front. I went with the Wraith color, which is this beautiful purple. All of the actual cube cards are also sleeved with Dragon Shield sealable perfect fit sleeves as well. Extra protection. I also sleeve my tokens. For one, because it makes them easier to spot on a crowded table. And for two, I just like the way they look sleeved. It gives them a more important look and makes them feel like official game pieces as opposed to some scraps of paper or a coin. I also like the ability to tap an actual token. I've always been a very visual person. This makes it super difficult for me to play test games with text-based proxies or keep track of tokens on a battlefield when they're not actual tokens. This is also the reason I love using real tokens. For tokens, I went with the Dragon Shield Mint Matte Sleeves. These aren't as opaque as the dual sleeves, but they don't really need to be. Remember when I was talking about contrast earlier? Again, I appreciate the contrast here between the two colors, the deep purple of the wraith sleeves and the bright green of the mint sleeves. As for which tokens are in here, I've included and sleeved every token that is possible to create within the cube, including emblems and even extra copies for cards that are likely to be copied. 
A hornet queen makes four bees, but if someone metamorphs it, eight bees. I also prefer what we'll call the modern full art tokens, and I update the cube tokens with these whenever possible. Another area of customization is the basic lands. This might be the most personal choice of all. In fact, no other cards in Magic have as many versions or styles. Originally, I had the full text secret layer lands. I always thought these were super cute and reiterating the comprehensive rule text for basic lands felt like it was peak vintage cube. Over time, however, I ended up feeling like they lacked a bit of personality and didn't really have that vintage cube feeling I was looking for. So I did a search on Scryfall for basic lands that had the retro frame and began to look for their replacements. I knew I wanted lands where the art was directly representative of their color. Specifically, I didn't want an island that had a ton of green in the art or a swamp that had a ton of purple. I wanted players to be able to look across the table and very clearly make out the basic lands their opponents had in play. I like the idea of the art and text boxes seamlessly blending together into one congruous blob of color. Only more elegantly than blobs. Eventually, I landed on the following selections. No pun intended. Onslaught Plains, number 332 by Matthew Mitchell. Invasion Island, number 336 by John Avon. Odyssey Swamp, number 341 by Rob Alexander. This portal Second Age Mountain that was released before numbering existed, also by Rob Alexander. And Invasion Forest, number 347, also by John Avon. My Vintage Cube also has a specific philosophy and hierarchy when it comes to the versions I choose. At the top of that hierarchy is Retro Frame Cards. If a card has a retro bordered version, that is the first choice for a card. This includes original old borders, new retro frames, and even collector's editions versions. If a secret layer has a retro border, I'll use that as well. Next up is showcase and secret layer versions. If a card does not have an old bordered version, a showcase or secret layer version is the next preferred option. This also includes things like expeditions. Like I said, I like art and I like what secret layers are doing to magic cards. I know a lot of people might not. I think they're cool. After that comes extended art and borderless versions. If neither of the above two versions are available, extended art and borderless versions are the next preferred option for cards. To me, these are strictly better than the regular printing of cards in the modern frame, but your mileage may vary, of course. Then comes the first printing of a card. If none of the above options are available for a card, the card's first printing will be used. And I say this because most of the time that's just a modern frame card, which I'm not a huge fan of. Otherwise, you're just using retro frame. There are, of course, some exceptions. Some cards, such as invitational winner cards that have the winning player represented in their art, have extremely classic art, despite one of the more preferred versions existing. In this situation, the nostalgic versions take precedence. Dark Confidant is an example that comes to mind, where the original Ravnica version is used over the Borderless Double Masters option. Finally, there are no foils in my cube. There are also no foreign or textless cards. Clarity is of the utmost importance for me when people are drafting my cube, and I don't want to assume anyone's familiarity with the game, especially with so many new cards being released month after month. Sure, you and I probably know every mode on Cryptic Command, but I don't want to assume everyone does. As I hope you can see, I get a significant amount of joy from making and customizing cubes. I put a lot of thought into them because I think the good ones both require and allow that. While every person who drafts one of my cubes may not appreciate the color coordination on the sleeves or always having dice available or never wanting for a correct token, I know some will. And I do. And maybe that's the best lesson of all. To do the things you enjoy for yourself and then maybe others will enjoy them too. Oh yeah, one last thing about the cube box itself. I also had Aaron add a handle for easy transportation, which wasn't a standard addition at the time. I'm not sure if it is now or not, but I've had him add it to every large Spartan I've ordered so far, which is three. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.